Um, so hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining. Um, I'm going to be speaking about data exploration today um, and a few solutions to some of the problems that are maybe not so trivial when it comes to exploring data. So what I want to talk about today is basically let's define what data exploration means. I assume that if I was to ask each one of you to give a definition, it would be slightly different from the previous person. Um, so I'm going to give you guys kind of my take on, wh on what it means. Um, I'll, I'll explain why it's hard, and it is hard, even though it sounds like a trivial concept. Um, spoiler, it has to do with humans being involved in the process. Um, and then I'm going to cover a few tools. Uh, some of them I helped create, some of them uh, I, I'm just using, uh, that are open sourced and can, that can solve some of these challenges. Um, so first I'll introduce myself. My name is Oz Katz. I'm the CTO uh, and one of the creators of a project called LakeFS, um, which we'll touch a little bit during this presentation. Um, you can grab the links here if you'd like. Um, but first let's start with what exploration means, or at least my definition of it. Um, feel free to disagree with it, of course. Um, so I categorize it by kind of three dimensions when it comes to exploring data. Um, so the whole idea here is that there's a lot of data out there in our organization, in the world, as open data sets, um, as very secret data sets, um, depending on where we work. Um, and we want to get a feel, we want to get an understanding of what this data actually means, what it represents, and how it could be useful for whatever goal we're trying to achieve. Um, so the three interesting dimensions that I chose to focus on um, is time, space, and behavior. So time is the most nuanced one because it has kind of different takes on what it means. Um, so time, when you look at data, could be like, how often does this data get updated? Is it recent? Is it very old? Um, is it out of date? Um, it has to do with like which version of the data am I looking at? Right, so I can be looking at the data right now and like extracting some value from it. And then tomorrow someone changes it and it looks completely different. Maybe I don't have a way to look at the data that I relied on just a second ago. Um, and of course, when we talk about time and we talk about systems that deal with data, we also have to take into account latency. Right? If we have something that we want to explore and just get a feel of and want to get an understanding, we probably don't want to sit around and wait for everything to load for a very long time. Um, for space, it's mostly about where's this data? How does it kind of look like? How is it structured? Um, what size is it, right? All the physical properties of the data. Um, and then the last one, which is, if you remember the spoiler, has a lot to do with the humans behind the data, is the behavior, right? So if I have this column, what does it actually mean? Which values am I expecting to see there? What would be the cardinality of it? How is this data related to some other data set that might be using same language or same IDs, maybe a foreign key. How does this all connect? Um, for me, these three are kind of key concepts when we talk about exploration, right? And there's a data set I'm not familiar with. These are kind of the questions I would like to get answered before I could start actually using it and getting value from that. Um, so you might be thinking to yourself, that's fine, I can just do select star limit 10 and here I explored the data. Um, and if you're using like a data warehouse or some data platform, Databricks, Snowflake, or someone else uh, who's very happy to take your money, um, they have some solutions, right? They have notebooks, um, they have like a SQL editor that you can play around with. Um, but at least my take is that in many cases, this is not good enough. Not if you look at the previous dimensions that we just saw. Um, so raise your hand if you're familiar with this user interface from Databricks. Anyone? No, but you've probably seen something kind of in the line of this, right? I'm running a SQL, I see a table. It's kind of common practice to see how long it took at the bottom. Um, so when we talk about very large data, even if in this example where I'm only doing like a limit 10, I'm only looking for, like give me 10 lines from this table. I don't really care which ones. I just want to get a feel of the data. And this takes seven seconds, right? And if I want to get another take, another another thing, maybe try to see other columns, maybe another snippet of the data, another seven seconds will pass. Like everything moves kind of slowly um, because data warehouses were never built for this use case, right? They're not meant for interactive work. Um, 
this is a very fake representation of how those seven seconds actually distribute. Um, weird JVM stuff, I'm probably underestimating, but it's something like that. Um, and actually, like the part that we care about, just you know, give me some data file, take a small snippet from it, return it to the user. That's a very small proportion out of that. Um, and these are costs that make a lot of sense if I'm running a huge job that's meant to transform billions of rows, right? I don't care that it takes six out of the seven seconds to spin up something because then it does something on a billion rows. But I'm looking for 10 and I have to pay that same price. Um, another dimension of time. So here I want to give you a story that's probably relatable to most of you, if not all of you. Um, this is an actual stories. The names have been changed. So um, typical day at the office, right? Uh, here comes the CEO of our e-commerce business. Uh, and she's asking, how much did we sell in Q1? Right? And we are deep into, I don't know, Q2, Q3 by now, and we want to get that historical information. Alice was a great analyst, runs a report on the data warehouse, extracts all the information, um, and says, we sold 200 pairs of shoes. All right, um, that's enough information for Jane to now make decisions about purchasing, about inventory. Um, but then, a short while after that, here comes Bob. That's not me. Um, and he says, oh, I forgot to update this table with a few things that like one of our warehouses forgot to input into the system. So I'll just do it now. Um, and this is information about something in the past, right? I'm adding it now, but it happened before. Um, so Jane, our CEO, comes back a month after that. I'm saying something doesn't really add up with that 200 shoes number that we saw before. Can you please rerun this report? So Alice, being a good data analyst, runs the same query again on the same input data and gets back a completely different result. And in this case, 37,000 something pairs of shoes. Like, how can I make business decisions based on something that I can't even really trust? All right, so the dimension of time, when am I running this query and something that's ever changing and evolving, um, is really, really challenging, right? Being able to reproduce something is kind of key for data systems. Um, space is maybe the easiest one. So anyone works with S3 here in the audience? Raise your hand. Okay, uh, so you've probably seen this beautiful, beautiful UI before, right? This is an example of a large data set um, representing uh, orders over time for some business. Um, but in reality, if you just look at it, you see a bunch of parquet files with UURD in their names. It's not very informative, right? So just looking at the bare data as is, I can get maybe an indication of how big the data is if I try to sum up how many files I have here and what's their average size. It's not gonna give me a lot of information. And in general, it's not really a fun UI to look at. It's not very informative. Um, and then the last one, we're humans. Um, so another example, in this case, uh, I'm just showing the list of tables that Salesforce knows how to kind of put out that you can consume. Um, anyone wants to take a guess how many different tables are in Salesforce? Like if you actually scroll down that list and count all of them, how many are there? Each one representing something that the business should care about, right? So I'll just give you the answer. It's 2,994 different tables. Um, and, and good luck understanding what you're actually looking for and where that really important piece of information actually hides, right? Um, and if you even know which table you're looking at, here's an example one, okay? So we have one of our columns is named country, and it's of the worst data type imaginable, which is a string. And why is it bad? Um, so we're in Luxembourg now, as you probably know. Um, how do I query this? How do I filter out Luxembourg? Right? It's a string. It could be up to 80 characters. Um, spoiler alert, it's several of these. Right? So if you look at the database, you'll find pretty much examples for each and every one of those, and maybe a few other ones. One that's all capitalized, one that's, I don't know, just a country code, which is a number, but represented as a string. It's really, really hard to understand. Um, and, and yeah, Who's to blame here? It's it's not the system, right? It's the human behind it who like built a process that ended up looking like this. Um, this article solve your issue? Not really. Um, 
so what can we do about this? How can we create something that helps us in terms of time, like understanding how data changes over time, being able to run small queries but quickly, um, manages to help us with space. Where is my data? Which types of data I have? Who's generating it? Um, and also the behavior, right? Some context about the actual information being represented, right? The stuff I won't see if I just do a select star limit 10. Um, so here I want to talk about two open source projects that kind of work pretty well together. Um, so the first one is named LakeFS, which I uh, objectively like um, for some reasons. Um, and the second one is DuckDB. So I'll introduce both. Um, so let's start with DuckDB. Raise your hand if you heard about the project. No one. Okay. It's going to be interesting for you. Um, so DuckDB is essentially an in-process database. Right? If anyone's familiar with SQLite, it's very, very similar in approach. But instead of being really efficient at working on like smaller data sets or maybe doing like very selective queries, right? If you're building a web application or something like that, you'd use SQLite for that. Um, DuckDB actually lets you embed a pretty much full featured data warehouse, right? You could do analytics and aggregations and like all the stuff that Snowflake and Databricks can do, but in process, right? You put it on your machine, it's a single binary, uh, you import it from Python and you do crazy aggregations. That's kind of the concept for, for DuckDB. Um, it started as an academic project, um, but it gained quite a lot of traction recently. Uh, a lot of companies are into data, AI stuff, generative AI. Um, and this is something that's a lot faster and a lot easier for a consume, especially when you don't care about looking at billions of rows. Right? Most of us don't really have that scale. Um, and when we talk about data exploration, we definitely don't want to look at billions of rows. We want to know how Luxembourg is represented uh, in, in our country field. Um, so that's one part of the equation. Uh, the nice thing about DuckDB is that if you remember the breakdown from before, essentially DuckDB runs on your laptop, right? It's a small binary that you, it doesn't scale out in any which way. Um, so it also doesn't have like all the kind of constant costs that distributed systems have, right? There are no multiple nodes that have to be coordinated and like code being generated on the fly and shipped to different servers and like all the rest of this diagram, DuckDB doesn't do. It doesn't care about that. Um, I probably wouldn't use it on petabytes of data, um, but if I have my Salesforce table that I just want to understand which countries exist there, um, it lets me do that with a fraction of that con constant cost. Right? All I have to do is fetch a small snippet of the data, extract something from it, and in process, get back the result. Um, so in our example, same select star limit 10. Uh, in this case, instead of taking seven seconds, it takes 159 milliseconds, which is a bit less uh, than we saw before. Uh, and, and the thing is, even that is when like, I'm querying it from here in Europe, the data is on US West 2, I believe. So just in terms of like speed of light, that's 18,000 kilometers round trip, um, which is roughly 60 milliseconds. Uh, you probably need more than one of those. Um, so most of the cost is just going and fetching that small snippet of data. Um, if our data is closer, it's going to be actually even much faster than that. Um, a nice thing about this, what you're actually seeing, so this query, and even if I was to run a more complex query, doesn't actually run on some remote server. It actually fetches the data onto my local browser and using a technology called WebAssembly actually executes the query on my client, on my machine. Right, so if you think about it, instead of like spinning up a data warehouse with multiple cores, I already have those multiple cores here. My company already paid a few thousand dollars for this. Uh, and it's a pretty powerful machine. Um, and, and especially with modern CPUs, like you can get very, very high performance on a single machine on your laptop doing this. Um, pausing that for a second. Um, let's talk about the second piece of the puzzle. So we talked about the time dimension, or at least the part where we want to be able to execute something really quickly and with low latency. Um, the second part of the equation is the behavior and the space. And, and this is where LakeFS comes in. So what is LakeFS? Essentially, if you would think about something like Amazon's S3, Google Cloud Store, Azure Blob, all the object stores that are typically involved with systems like this, um, and you overlaid Git on top of that, Right? So imagine you can create a bucket and then just branch off of it, do whatever you want on that bucket without it actually 
interfering with other people's work, and then committing and merging it back, right? And you have an actual commit ID, right? So I can say, show me this entire bucket, and it could be even petabytes of data, but as I looked at it yesterday, or with the changes that this guy introduced. Um, so all the power and all the capabilities that Git would provide, but on essentially petabytes of data. Uh, and this is what LakeFS does. Uh, so you can see here in this example, instead of just querying S3, I'm querying S3 and then slash main, the name of my branch. This could be a branch, commit ID, whatever. Uh, and the nice thing about LakeFS is that it doesn't actually create an entire copy of everything every time you create a branch. Um, it does it on a metadata layer. So it actually just creates pointers to the objects that existed for that specific commit or for that specific branch. Um, and it does so in a very efficient way. Um, so the nice thing, if we talked about DuckDB before, and we saw how you can just embed it directly into your browser. So the LakeFS UI actually goes a step further and just embeds DuckDB directly into the LakeFS UI, right? So if I'm on GitHub and I'm looking at code, I can just see the code as is. On S3, I would see just a list of UUIDs. Remember that sad face that I showed you? Um, so imagine if you could just instead run a query directly on those objects. Um, and this is what LakeFS does, right? So what you're seeing here is the LakeFS UI, right? So it looks kind of similar to GitHub, GitLab, all the different like GitOps tools, um, but you get a full featured SQL running in your browser using your CPU, right? So there's no compute or server to manage here fetching the data directly from the LakeFS version that you told it um, and returning that result into your browser, right? And you get all the like data warehousing capabilities, but just embedded on, on your Google Chrome or Firefox or whatever. Um, so what can we do with this? How is this useful? So if you remember Jane, uh, our CEO, in the example that we shot before, where, where Bob was updating something kind of midway, um, so what if instead of directly updating the data that everyone's looking at, Bob was working on an isolated branch, right? I'm introducing a change for something that's not current, for something that people already relied on. Let's do it on a separate branch. And once we do that, we can actually just go and compare between the different branches, right? So I can see the report as I executed it initially, right? I can see a report that gives me 200 shoes. But if I want the latest and greatest that might not be consistent with what I saw before, I can choose to do so, running on Bob's dev backfill something branch. All right, so LakeFS lets you kind of switch between those commits very, very easily. And with DuckDB, you actually get a, a sample of the data itself. Um, yeah, so here's an example of what these branches actually look like within LakeFS. So just like in Git, uh, a branch is just a pointer to some commit ID. And you can see that these two IDs are actually different from one another because the data is different between them. If I was just to create another branch off of main and not touch anything, I would see just the same ID. Right? So this is very similar to Git. But when I go and I look at the commit that Bob introduced, I actually get a lot of context from that commit. Right? I see, okay, I suddenly sold all these shoes that I haven't seen before. Let's see why this data is now different than what it was. Um, so what can I see here? I can see who introduced this change. So this is my name. Imagine it says Bob instead. It's his fault, not mine. Um, I can see when he did that change, right? So we have a separation of like when the shoes were actually sold and when I introduced the change to my data, right? Which are two distinctly different dates. Um, I can add any arbitrary metadata into that commit, such as what did I actually update? In, th in this case, death under five equals something. I, I can put the actual query that modified the data. Um, and I can see that these are the files that were modified or these are the data sets that were modified, right? So if Bob touched the sales table, but also the inventory table, I would see both of them as a cohesive unit, right? This is a commit. Um, and if I don't like Bob and I don't like the change that I introduced, I can even just click a button and revert that commit, right? Someone accidentally put something in production that he shouldn't have. Imagine I could just hit a button just roll it back. And I know exactly what I'm getting because I can just look at that previous commit before we did the change. Um, yeah, so both of these projects, as mentioned, are open source. Um, so you can use LakeFS either through LakeFS Cloud, which is managed service, or just spin it up yourself, clone the repo, or just run the Docker command and get it running on your machine. It doesn't require any infrastructure. DuckDB comes embedded into its UI. 
Um, so if you already have existing information on your object store, parquets, CSVs, JSON files, you can click a button, import them into LakeFS. It doesn't actually copy the data and just points to it. Um, and then you can just immediately query it using DuckDB or any other tool on top of LakeFS. Um, and with that, I'm done. I'm happy to hear your questions or thoughts. Thank you. So the question is, do I have the opportunity to use this in my day-to-day? -day? So actually, it's a funny story. Uh, one of the reasons why we went and created the project to begin with. Um, so I used to work at an analytics company called SimilarWeb. We managed, uh, I think when I left, it was around eight and a half petabytes of data on S3. Um, and there was like a daily job that has to run every day called retention. And what it does, it's, it deletes data. Right, it looks for data that's no longer being referenced by all these types of business rules and then chooses what to delete and deletes it. Um, and it's a job that everyone just hated to touch, right? Because if you introduce a bug, like, where are you going to test it? You're not going to create a staging environment with eight and a half petabytes, right? Um, so you can essentially only test it in production. Um, and I wanted to make it faster, which I did, but I also introduced a small bug. Um, and I deleted close to one petabyte of data, 750 million different objects which we then had to restore one by one using the S3 API. And then I said, okay, there should be a better way. And that was actually one of the reasons why we created the project. Okay, I'll be hanging around if there are any other questions, we have to hear them. Thank you. <laughs>